ओम शांति The two words seal and enthusiasm are interesting because when you first hear them you wonder well what's the difference between them and yet there is a very powerful difference and when you hear this word enthusiasm it has the word theo in between n t u as m and so it comes from a greek word and theo means god theology the study of spiritual truth religion and so on so related to god and so when i have god in my heart when i have god in my awareness then enthusiasm stays with me and if i get distracted by anyone or anything then the level of enthusiasm drops down because my attention has now scattered instead of being focused on one and connected with one now i've got other things going on in my buddhi my intellect but this other word seal well if you think about a bottle of soft drinks aerated drinks whatever it is you used to have probably you don't have these things anymore but you used to have them and what used to happen was that when you open it up then there's a burst that comes out with a lot of fizzle and then gradually the bubbles wear down and then it begins to settle down Well, that image serves to explain what seal is when there's something very specific that's happening maybe it's a celebration for 10 years maybe it's any other event whether it's shivratri or whether it's baba's coming all of these things create this immediate surge of energy and there's a uh, there's a seal to be part of that to be with it to be involved in it especially if i'm engaged in some type of service then at that moment my energy level is very high and then after the project finishes what happens next everything calms down quietens down and the bubbles go flat and then you feel a little bit tired a little bit exhausted it's over what am i going to do now this was taking up all my time and energy in such a constructive creative productive way and now i'm left just with an ordinary mediocre stage so zeal can come and it'll bring that upsurge temporarily but any project even if it's a long term project it has a beginning and an end and it's going to finish at some time and what we found during covid was that you couldn't do things outside and so somehow drama baba saved us and we started online service and that was great because it kept up the seal of the brahman family we had 82 year olds learning how to set up zoom cameras and handling it with a computer themselves and conducting 7 day courses online and in fact the person i'm thinking about in london a sister called ann she's now 82 i think or maybe even older um certainly over 80 and she not only started to learn all this and do it herself she didn't need any further technical assistance with her she managed it all on her own but when there were students coming online and they'd say oh i can't manage to do this i can't do this i can't do that she would take them through it and explain them to others also so that was incredible but this is the thing that um baba drama intervene to give us something to entertain us and keep us occupied in a 
way that creates our fortune and we're able to serve and help others. But imagine a time in which there isn't any possibility of external service. Is that going to happen? Very likely. I think more than likely. At a time when either there's natural disasters, there's a, a hurricane, a typhoon, you don't know what's going to happen next. Maybe just a flood. It's not as dramatic as a hurricane, but it's as nasty, it's insidious, and it cuts you off from everyone. Global House has, in the last few years, usually it happens once a year, that something goes on and there's a flood or there's a police case in the neighborhood and where we are, that area gets cordoned off and you can't go out and no one can come in. Now, that's a place that's usually quite manageable. But even there, as I say, nearly every year, once a year, there's some sort of situation that comes up. We get drug cases. And so the police then go out on a search. And then that's when we get cordoned off or the pipes break and something goes wrong. And so then there's a flood in our road. So things will happen. More and more things will happen. Maybe there's terrorism that goes on. Who knows? But there will be situations in which not only will I not be able to go out and serve, but equally the devices that we have that we're dependent on today, whenever there's any emergency, the first thing that governments do nowadays is cut the telephone lines, stop the towers from operating, so there's no further access. So you are left on your own with whoever are your companions with you, or if no companions on your own, one Baba, one and one alone. And so better that I prepare for it today. If my adrenaline rush is through service, can I stop and say, well, I'm not going to be dependent on that. I'm going to make sure that it's my gyan, my yoga, my connection with Baba that gives me the love and the enthusiasm and the joy, the contentment that I need. I don't need to look outside. Services, yes, in God's love, but it's still very external. And so the preparation has to be from today for the time when there are no new projects except Mansa Seva. Baba's been preparing us for this for quite a long time. And of course, that time will definitely come. This is what is going to happen. And so, yes, it's fine to have new projects and get engaged in those and have that zeal that's going to keep me moving forward fast in which I don't think about food, I don't think about sleep, I just think about Baba and Seva. Fine, I create my fortune through all of that. But I mustn't be dependent. And so to be independent, I need to just ask myself, what is it that I need to cultivate within me to keep my enthusiasm for Brahman life constantly moving? And so to have a life that's centered around God is really the only way to maintain enthusiasm for Brahman life. Brahman means the twice born. We had our physical birth, however many years ago we had it. But our second birth is our spiritual birth. Do you remember the intoxication of when Baba first found you? I remember being so intoxicated, so much in love with God, that I thought that I could become karmatit in one year. And that was my ego speaking, <laughs> because I didn't even understand what I need to do to become karmatit. But gradually you get to know yourself, you understand what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, and you know that Baba's going to help you with your weaknesses. 
But very often, after that first honeymoon period with Baba, then when things settle and you start seeing your son's scars and you start noticing the son's scars of others, there's a time when you're in Gyan and you look at everyone with awe that they've been a yogi for five years or 10 years or 40 years and you put them on a pedestal in your mind and you think that they must be nearly perfect. And then when you discover that they're not quite perfect, then many questions can arise. And so can I have that same enthusiasm as I did at the very beginning. So what was happening at that beginning period when I was so enthusiastic that others had to tell me, look, it's okay, slow down a bit. You don't need to rush ahead so fast because it's like the story I explained this morning about the sister in the wheelchair and somebody telling her, um, that's karma. Um, you're so enthusiastic that you don't think about the other person, you're just wanting to share, wanting to give. And then if the other person's not ready to take, then you don't understand it. Why not? I, I wanted to hear these things so much. How come the rest of the world isn't ready to listen? So my period of honeymoon lasted for about a year because longer. I came into Gyan in April 68 properly meeting Baba in childhood, Mama in childhood, and then through my teens, meeting Baba again was all part of the beautiful journey. But understanding Gyan and making that decision, this is to be my life, that started in April 68. And then Baba sent me back to London in June 69. And so about a year later, and so all the time that I was in India, now I understand it was not so much real enthusiasm, it was constantly spikes of zeal because there were constantly new things that were happening, new experiences that I was being exposed to and it was powerful and beautiful and I was on a high all the time. And that's when I thought, I can be karmatit in a year. Why is it taking people so long? And then coming to London, I didn't have a single piece of paper I could share with anyone because they all had the India addresses. Now, London and India are 5,000 miles away. Um, I can't give them an introduction about Brahma Kumaris and say, find out more and go to India. And things were not so easy to manage with service, just in your own Lockheed home. So wherever I went, I was getting the door shut in my face. And remember, I'd, I didn't know anything about bhakti in this birth. Um, I'd gone with my grandmother to temples, but that was mostly to eat the prasad uh, and to meet other children who were there also. It wasn't understanding why I'm going to the temple, what this is all about. So no bhakti background. And then only a year of gyan. And I was knocking on the door of these masters who were having yoga classes, mostly the physical yoga. By then, that was there. And when they'd say, but what would you like to tell us? Then I'd say, well, I'd like to tell you about Raj Yoga. Oh, really? You studied Raj Yoga? And of course, they meant the Ashtanga Raj Yoga, and with are eight steps, and you finally get to Raj Yoga. And I'd explain, I knew that much at least, that I hadn't done the Ashtanga yoga. Um, and so I'd say, no, this is a very modern interpretation of yoga. And it's come to us from God. And like Baba said yesterday in the morning, don't tell people God has come. Well, I didn't actually use those words, but pretty much close to that. And they would look at me and smile and say, well, at the moment, we are very busy. We've got enough teachers. We don't need anyone more. <laughs> and so the door would shut. And so none of the yoga organizations that were around, and I would find out which of the organizations and go to visit them. And so after a couple of months of this, by August, I wrote to Dadiji. Dadiji could read English. 
Daddy Janki later on could even speak English, but Daddy Ji could read English. And so she said to me, don't worry about Hindi, write to me in English and you can read Hindi. So I'll re respond to you in Hindi or Sindhi. My mother could read Sindhi. So, and for the daddies, that was their mother tongue. So it was easy for them. So I wrote to Daddy Ji saying that there's no service here. And what can I do? I think I should come back to India where there's plenty of service. And Daddy Ji's reply came, probably via Rosie Ben. It was in very good English. So I think Rosie Ben must have been in Madhuban at the time. You know Rosie Ben? Some of you know her from Chennai. She started service in Chennai. She passed on some years ago. So the letter said, Never mind about service outside. What about self-service? And that letter saved my spiritual life. Because if I'd just gone around knocking on doors any further and just getting no, 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 I think I would have said, oh, what's the point of all this? Let me do something else that's more interesting. But when Daddy Ji wrote Think about self-service. That saved my skin. It made me make sure that I did proper yoga. I made a timetable for myself for two hours of yoga every day, apart from, um, sorry, not two hours, within every two hours, 30 minutes of yoga every day. And I was fortunate I wasn't being pushed to get a job or to go to uni or anything like that. So my father thought, you know, give her enough time and she'll get bored and she'll want to do something else. But I'd found something else to do that was far more interesting. And so the practice of yoga plus keeping a chart of soul consciousness, this actually made sure that I stayed with Baba and I kept my enthusiasm for gyan and yoga and came out of that period. That was about 14 months. About 14 months later, a door opened at an organization. And after that, the service just was flying, flying, flying. But I was no longer dependent on service. And the ego of I, I can do this, that was gone. You learn a lot through failure. I think there was um, an object signal just recently in which Baba spoke about this, that when failure comes, if you take it as a lesson, then you learn from it and you move forward. And it's not failure. It's actually a lift for you to move forward. Think about moving from here to there. It's never just a straight line. There's always many turns and twists and curves that come in the way. And especially if you're on hilly terrain, then again, you see where you want to go, but there's a few hills to tackle before you get there. And so sometimes you're going up, but when you're coming down, not to get depressed by that, but to know that it's still taking you closer in the direction to your destination. You learn from every time you go down, but there's another hill to climb and another and another. And each time you're moving forward to your destination. And then it's not a failure in that sense of becoming hopeless and helpless and frustrated or anything. No, it's a lift to carry you to your next stage and the next stage. And so from practical experience, I know that to depend on any external type of service is not very healthy. It's going to create that vacuum unless you know that I mustn't be dependent on that and I mustn't let myself get into a space in which I feel I've got nothing. No, I have Baba. I have everything. And Baba's here to help me keep moving forward. And what might seem to be a failure to others is actually a learning curve for me. 
There was another very interesting statement that I always remember from Jagdish Pai. Jagdish Pai spent quite, time, quite some time in London. He was one of the first of the delegation who came with Dr. Nirmala, Ramesh Pai, Rosie Ben, Dadi Shilindra, so five of them. And so that was in June 1971, when the whole delegation was sent by Baba to do world service. And they started in London, spent a month there, and established a center, and then moved on and on. And he used to say, sometimes it's better to lose an argument and keep a friend, just in the same way as you could lose a battle, but you win the war. And it's a bit of a violent metaphor, but the point is that you get into an argument with somebody and you want to prove yourself right. Well, maybe you are right and you can prove it, but meanwhile, what's happened to the relationship with the other one? They're not going to talk to you again because you've been too forceful in the way in which you proved yourself right. And so sometimes what appears to be a loss isn't a loss. You're learning and moving forward. So yes, if I lose the battle, it's okay. But the war is the big one with Maya and ignorance and ego. And so if I win that war, that's my purpose. So in service, a little bit up, a little bit down, it's okay. It doesn't really matter. And I remember another situation in which it was very interesting. Um, we had a group of brothers that were very strong in the early days in London. Um, Indian service hadn't yet picked up. And the English Morley had about 25 people, more brothers than sisters in those early days. And the Hindi class was just about four or five. And so the English Morley class was the one that was taking initiatives, creating programs and service and all of that. So there was quite a lot of zeal and enthusiasm in terms of service. And at one point we were discussing there was limited time, limited energy, and so we could either do an exhibition or we could do an event. We couldn't manage both according to the situation. So at first there was this big discussion and everybody was quite vocal. And then we finally decided that we'd tried exhibitions and it was hard work and not really very successful. And so we decided we were going to have a program and we knew what sort of people to bring, who could be the speakers, but we couldn't think of a title. And everybody was arguing about what title should it be. Again, very vocal, very energetic. Um, and after a little while, I just said to the group that it was by then the evening and it's time to finish and okay, We'll meet again tomorrow morning after class and finalize. And most of the brothers that were from that group were actually living together in a place called Shanti Bhavan. Shanti Bhavan still exists. And one of the original residents, Peter, is now in his late 80s, but he's still there. Um, and most of the other brothers have either gone to Australia for service and gone other places for service. So the brothers went home and I was in Baba's house anyway, so we finished the meeting. Next morning after class, two, two of the brothers came to me and said that they'd been deputed by the rest of the group who had had to rush off to work, but these two had space and time so that they could come and talk to me. And they came up with the title that they had discussed back home in Shanti Bhavan. And I instantly said yes to them. And they said, do you think if we had said boots and saddles, you would have accepted it? 
And I understood what they meant, that I was ready to accept whatever title they would come up with, even something that's got nothing to do with Raj Yoga, like boots and saddles. And they said, yes, I would have accepted whatever it is all of you had agreed on. Because anything that you do, if it's with unity, then it's going to be successful. If it's not through unity, it's not going to have the same power. And so they laughed and laughed because that's what they knew, that unless they came together with one idea, it wasn't going to work. So my point that if I give in to somebody else's idea and that's going to help move things forward, it's absolutely fine. I haven't lost anything. But my flexibility, adjustability at that time ensures that my own stage of enthusiasm and love for Baba stays constant. Otherwise, if my head is thinking, well, it has to be like this, why isn't it like this? Then when something else is happening, not only do I lose my zeal, I also lose my enthusiasm. And then I get stuck. Then I say, but what's the point of service? There's only going to be arguments. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to be responsible. And so all these waste thoughts start coming. And not only has my seal disappeared, but my enthusiasm has also now become very diluted. And so I must ensure that I remain in love with Baba. I don't allow service or any other distraction to take away any experience of that love. I keep that love alive and sacred. And service is God's responsibility. Yes, if I choose to create my fortune and use my time, my thoughts, my resources in a positive, worthwhile way, fine, I'll get the reward of that. But even if I don't have any resources, not even time, not even energy, not even money, nothing, and I just simply love Baba and do Mansa Seva, but I keep my enthusiasm for my Brahman life alive, I'm going to move to my destination very quickly. And so very important not to allow service to become a distraction. Service means many sanskars. Nobody can do service on their own. It's just not possible. How much can you do on your own? But I have to find ways to keep the enthusiasm alive simply by knowing that whatever I can do in terms of service, yes, it's my fortune, but because of service to let my enthusiasm diminish will create a big blockage for me. And so how do I keep my enthusiasm alive? By keeping God in the center point, God at the heart of everything that I do. Again, go back to your days of childhood. If you remember Sakar Murli's even Avyat Murli is actually, how often does Baba say to us, just remember the days of your childhood? Why is Baba saying this? Because days of childhood, we were just amazed that Baba found us. And there was such a strong contrast of life pre gyan and post gyan that we knew that this huge transformation and everybody has this big transformation when they first come to Baba. So we know at that moment it's God. It's not a human being, whoever is the nimit, the instrument teacher. They haven't made me a Brahmin. They're not giving me this knowledge. It's come from another source. The power of Gyan is so incredible that it brings about change very, very quickly. But then seeing my son's scars, so one thing is since the, the service story. The other thing is the sun scars story. How long does that last? <laughs> like Baba says, it's going to last till the end. And ego 
it's the big, big one that takes away my enthusiasm and my attention away from God. Ego is something to deal with right from the beginning through the middle to the end. This is why in every single Sakar Murli, Baba reminds us not once, five times, eight times, in one Murli, soul consciousness, soul consciousness, practice detachment from the body, practice the bodiless stage, experience what is soul consciousness. And so ego, the opposite of soul consciousness, and the ego that I can do it, the ego that the uh, superiority, well, I know that I have humility. How come people don't see my humility? Is that statement ego or is it humble? So sometimes, well, most times we don't recognize ego. Why? Because it's a tail that's behind me. Hanuman's tail was a long tail, but it was behind him. And only when the tail caught fire, then did Lanka burn. And I'm not talking about the island of Lanka today, Sri Lanka, but the world. They say that Ravan was dead, but Lanka still stood. And Hanuman was on the roof. Somehow his tail caught fire and he was thumping his tail and he was jumping from roof to roof. But wherever he was thumping, of course, the fire was getting worse and worse. But finally, when he jumped around and set fire to the whole of Lanka, Lanka burned and Ravan's kingdom ended and the ego, the tail of Hanuman also burnt away. Nothing of that remained. So what that's telling us is that when we've dealt with our ego, then Ravan's kingdom will finish. And so drama is waiting for us to make that happen. And so the puncture in enthusiasm is, again, me and my sanskars. And no sanskars, of course, stem from body consciousness. We learned that in the first lesson. But yet, we don't always apply it in a very practical way. Where is it that it's my ego that's not allowing me to be happy and be able to fly with enthusiasm? Enthusiasm has to be constant. The seal, we finished. Okay, I'm not going to get stuck into just an adrenaline rush when there's special events. But I'm going to maintain my enthusiasm of Brahman life through Gyan and yoga and my own dharana. Gyan is beautiful, but it's very easy to get ego about Gyan. Oh, I understand. I've been studying Gyan for X years. I know everything that's in the Murlis. Of course, I know what Gyan is. So the ego of Gyan, that also takes away my Gyan. But the intoxication of Gyan, the beauty of Gyan, amazing. Baba, I love you so much because you've given me such amazing understanding of everything that's going on about myself, about yourself and the drama. And now I can truly stay calm and peaceful because I understand. But I mustn't get ego about Gyan. And then yoga. Very easy to think, I'm a good yogi. I've been practicing for X years. And so, of course, I'm a good yogi. But where my ego comes into the subject of yoga, that he once said, ego is not just here in the physical dimension. Ego will also follow you to the subtle region. And what she meant by that was that if I say, oh, I love the angelic stage, I have such amazing experiences of the angelic stage, <laughs> but if I'm having beautiful experiences of the angelic stage is my behavior, my dharana showing that. 
or is it not? And so the ego can follow you up to the subtle region also. So the ego of gyan, of yoga, so what is it that will save me from ego? My attention to the harana, the practical application of gyan and yoga. That is my fortune. If I give attention to my thoughts, my words, my actions, and I'm following Baba Srimad. So keeping Baba at the center of everything means Baba Srimad. Not just thinking of Brahma Baba's face, not just thinking about the point of light. All of those things can slip away. But Srimad is what I need to hold on to. And so following Srimad means that my enthusiasm can stay high because truly I stay connected with the one who is giving me Srimad, with the one who is teaching me Gyan. So keep, keep making sure that your happiness stays and your faith stays. Um, I feel that enthusiasm is the combination of both of these things, my faith, but also my happiness. And of course, faith and happiness also go together. Um, just to finish this thing about ego specifically, that because of my ego, where I think that I'm doing fine with gyan and yoga and I'm great at service and all of these ideas, um, and that becomes the obstacle and it actually deflates me. But sometimes the converse of the ego, the inferiority complex, oh, I don't really understand gyan, how can I give gyan to others? But my yoga is really not very good at all. I love Baba, but I'm not. <laughs> you know, the, this chatter that goes on in the mind, which is negative chatter. So ego has these two sides, this inferiority and superiority, two sides of the same coin. And so I just have to make sure that I don't fall into either of those traps. And for Brahmins, the inferiority complex comes more quickly than the superiority. It's something that is part of the legacy of Kali Yuga. Because most times, parents put the child down. Nowadays, there's lots of courses on parenting, but probably... When you were a child, your parents had never gone to a parenting course, right? <laughs> Nowadays, most children, their parents have definitely gone through at least one course, maybe more than that. But in our days, it wasn't so. And so they very often, of course, they had their own habits and so on. And so the... <coughs> The quickest response that a parent can give to a child is, no, don't do this. This is wrong. And so it's a negative message that came to us very, very often. And anyway, we started off our journey with very little knowledge of the self and so no self-esteem as such. And then the messaging was negative. And I repeated that in my own mind. And at school also, maybe old-fashioned schools that didn't understand about positive psychology. And so, again, the messaging then there also was not very assertive or supportive or encouraging. And so the messaging that we've been getting hasn't been helpful. And we come to Baba with very, very little self-esteem. And so that also has meant that we begin our journey carrying all that baggage. And so in Gyan, if I'm not instantly good at something or another, I lose faith in myself. And so Baba's saying, so Baba's reminding me, <coughs> that's a chaotic
So Baba is reminding me of just one thing that can restore self-esteem immediately. I am God's child. Just this one sentence, this one thought, and if you really hold it in your awareness, you begin to feel the beauty of this truth, the reality of this, the joy of this, and then further the intoxication of this. And so whenever there's a lack of enthusiasm, just go back to this one thought, I am God's child. Ego also gets deflated with this, because not only am I God's child, each and every one, not even just Brahmins, but even people out there, they're God's children. And so just seeing everyone as God's child and that faith is strong. Why I say faith and happiness is the foundation of enthusiasm is because when I look at other people's sanskars, and usually what happens is that we're not too bothered about the sanskars of people out there. We put it in our thoughts that, well, anyway, they don't know better. They don't know Baba. They don't know about soul. And so we justify it, and their bad behavior doesn't bother us too much. We say, you know, that's Kali Yuga. But when it's a Brahmin family, we have very high expectations of the whole family. Is that right? We expect that, well, didn't they hear Baba Smurli today? How come they're saying this? How come they're doing this? Baba talked about it today, and yet they're still not listening to Baba. So all of this starts moving in my head. And what happens? My love for Baba is being forgotten. My love from Baba, the door gets shut because of my own negativity coming out. And the negative vision that I have of the other colors everything that I'm doing. So I see everything with that vision. And of course, how can I be enthusiastic if I've got no faith in the Brahmin family? if my vision is negative. And of course, then it comes back to me. And I look at myself and I say, you know, I've been practicing Raj Yoga for X years and I'm not able to deal with the sanskar. So what's the point? And so the negativity goes worse and worse. And so when Baba says, have faith in the self, important. Have faith in God very important, have faith in others, especially Brahmins. With outsiders, you know it's Kali Yuga. You know it's a world of illusion and untruth. And so you have to be cautious, but still see them as God's children and send them those good vibrations. And the response will be a good response. But definitely, there's a protection that I need so that the negativity of Kali Yuga doesn't touch me. But with Brahmins, I have to see their speciality. There was one image that was used by a person in Sakar Baba's days, and it was a beautiful experience. Um, Baba was sitting there. I wasn't even properly in Gyan. But Baba had pulled me to the seminar that he was having. This was in 1967. It was just a few of us in Madhuban. And I was sitting there chopping nuts, sitting on that wall. That wall was there from then, um, just in front of where Daddy G's room is and the history hall. So there's that little garden. And so I was sitting there and Baba came out of his room. And the room where we have meditation was literally where Baba used to live. And so Baba came out of that room, saw me, beckoned me across, and held my hand, which was beautiful, very powerful. But then Baba started walking, and I was hesitating and holding back, because Baba had to go to the meeting. 
I knew Baba was headed for the meeting, that the meeting had started 10.30, and Baba told them, I'll, he'd said it in the Murli, children, start your meeting, and then I'll come and join you later. So it was 12 o'clock, and Baba was headed there. And Baba called it a seminar. It was a gathering of the dadis and the senior brothers all there. And where it's um, near Rabhai's office, there was a room in that area above that. It had newly been built. And so Baba started going up the stairs, and I hesitated again, but Baba pulled me. And then Baba entered the room, and I was ready to go down again. But again, Baba pulled me. And so then I just sat on the threshold, just literally, because the daddies, the dadas, and Baba in the middle, everyone on the floor, no chairs, everybody with their back up, upright, including Baba. And one of the, it's a whole long story with many questions that were asked to Baba, but one particular thing, Baba asked them, what has been your experience of this meeting? And a brother who um, had created South Extension Museum in Delhi, a very powerful place. So at that point, this brother said, Baba, I've learned that no matter how good a machine may be, but if there's even one screw missing, the machine can't function. So everyone is valuable in Baba's Yagya. I might be just a tiny little screw, but I'm valuable. And others see me with that value. And then the whole machine can start functioning. So Baba's Yagya, the whole family, and if I can see the speciality and the goodness of each one in the family and see my own value in the family also. Yes, Baba can find a thousand others to do his work, but Baba needs me. This is why Baba found me, and Baba made me belong to him. And Baba's nurtured me and sustained me and given me all that I need to bring me to this point where I am in my life's journey. But now I have to have faith in myself, but also faith in all of those who are in the Yakya. And when I have that faith, and I love Baba, yes, that faith and love keeps my intoxication high and my enthusiasm for everything, not just service. Waking up for Amrit Bela needs enthusiasm, coming for Murli needs enthusiasm, paying attention to my Dharana needs enthusiasm, Doing service needs enthusiasm. Doing little things in Baba's house needs enthusiasm. But also, if I keep my vision of the family absolutely positive and high, then my enthusiasm stays high also. So enjoy every moment with the Brahman family, but enjoy every moment on your own with Baba. Both, both things are important. And it's a joy being here, being with the big family of Malaysia. And congratulations for all the things that have happened so far that have been powerful and beautiful in this country. And with that enthusiasm, I know that whatever finally needs to happen will happen. Baba will make it happen so that we all go home together. But also, Baba had said to me at one point, There'll be a mic from every region. And that mic will point the finger upwards and say, truly, this is the one God. And when people from all the different regions point their finger upwards in this way to the one, yes, that will be God's revelation. So who knows? Maybe the mic is going to be from Malaysia. It's very possible because you have very high level connections. And yes, maybe the mic is going to be from here. But just keep moving forward with enthusiasm. Om Shanti.